160 years ago, back when Henry Ford was born, no one could have ever imagined the global changes in industry and culture that would take place over the next 10 to 20 years. Not to mention Henry's role in such changes. The United States has become the world's most automobile country, although in geographical terms, the automobile was first developed in Europe. However, it was nothing more than a means of transportation. Ford's contribution to the emergence of a new automobile culture is enormous, and here's why. Henry's Childhood and Early Years This story began in 1863, when America was facing challenging and turbulent times. The Civil War was in full swing. Meanwhile, in the north of the country, a family of Michigan farmers had their first child. The boy was named Henry. How Steam Inspired Henry Ford 1876 was a life-changing year for Henry. He lost his mother at the age of 13, but also got a hint of what path he would take for the next years of his life. The hint, rumbling and fuming, passed his father's wagon on the way to Detroit. It was a locomobile. But just to make it clearer, a locomobile is a tractor with a steam boiler instead of the common gasoline engine. Henry started to pick the machinist's brains about it. Proud of such an engineering marvel, he eagerly told the boy the way the steam wagon worked. If not for that event, there might not have been any Ford Motor Company. In 1878, without saying a word, 16-year-old Henry left for Detroit. After working here and there and gaining experience, he was hired as an engineer at the Edison Illuminating Company, founded by the brilliant Thomas Edison. Yes, the very Thomas Edison. In case you don't know anything about Edison, he was one of the major inventors of his time. Incandescent light bulbs, movie cameras, and the first music players. He was involved in the invention of all those things. We will talk about him in our upcoming videos. Well, let's get back to Henry. He was 30 years old, and it was 1893. A German auto two-cylinder engine ended up in his hands, so he redesigned the engine and adapted it to a four-wheeled, self-propelled carriage. It was Henry Ford's first vehicle that could properly travel. Just think about it. It was 1893. There was no internet, no dedicated literature, not even a mentor. Nevertheless, Henry did it. It was a great success. Win on Sunday, sell on Monday. The Edison Illuminating Company management didn't approve of the chief engineer's hobbies, and as a result, Henry resigned in 1899, when the choice of priorities had become a point-blank question. After all, Henry sold his first vehicle so he could get the money for constructing an improved model, a delivery van. Backed by the mayor of Detroit and assisted by several businessmen, Ford managed to accumulate enough money to create the Detroit Motor Company. In that project, Henry assigned himself the role of a common engineer with a salary of $150 a month. A year later, after selling only 22 cars, the company collapsed. The cars were expensive and inferior to their competitors. No sales, so Ford decided to stimulate them, dedicating himself to the construction of sports cars. He chose sports cars for one simple reason. Winning a race or even setting a record was the best advertising for any car company at that time. Win on Sunday, sell on Monday, Henry said. Ford's first car was ready in 1901, just in time for the start of the 10-mile circuit races. The race was won, and the prize fund was used to establish his own company, Ford Motor Company. But that was only the beginning. In 1902, Henry built two more cars that made him famous all over America, Ford 999 and Ford Arrow. The cars had identical structure. The first was fiery red, while the second one was bright yellow. Each had an 18.8 liter engine. 18.8 liters. The Dodge Challenger with its 6.2 looks like a little economy car. The only problem was to find a madman who would agree to drive this 100 horsepower monster on wheels without a body, brakes, and fairings. So, meet Tom Cooper a cyclist, 1898 and 1899 cycling champion. When Henry showed him his beast, he was a bit shocked. He probably thought it should be called Ford 666. Later, Tom asked Barney Oldfield to race him, upon which he heard, hold my beer. Then, in 1902, he finished first in the eight kilometer race. A nationwide reputation was gained, the charter capital for the new company derived mostly from the money won, and the road to realizing the dreams of the young Henry Ford 
was opened. Four, an independent spirit. June 16, 1903 is considered to be the date of the Ford Motor Company's founding. In theory, it is so. With the money raised from winning races and the help of a coal magnate, Henry managed to hire 12 workers, but the car assembly still took place in a brick garage of 76 by 15 meters on Mack Avenue. So far, it has been a subassembly of cars from third-party components. The next step to the crown of America's automobile king was the purchase of a controlling 51% stock. For those who don't quite understand what stock is and why it was necessary to buy the 51% stock, let me explain. A stock is a share in a company. The percentage of stock you own is your share in the company. The bigger part of the company you own, the more control you have over it. And if you have that 51% of the stock, that means you own most of the company. So whatever you say will happen. So let's proceed with our story. On November 22nd, 1905, Henry finally managed to buy 51% of the stock. However, he was forced to sacrifice the revenues from selling the already successful Model N. Instead, he completely abandoned any third-party components. Ford was on its way to full independence. This process ended only in 1913. The Birth of Tin Lizzie Even though orders for the Model N increased greatly, the work on the Model T started in the experimental room of Ford's factory on Paquette Avenue about two years before the car was announced to dealers on March 19, 1908. The car was the brainchild of a 12-member engineering team led by Ford. The Model T was first presented to dealers on October 1, 1908, with prices ranging from $825 to $1,000 depending on body type. The design of the Tin Lizzie, as it was affectionately called by customers, was extremely innovative and reliable. The frame was pressed from strong, lightweight, vanadium alloyed steel. The frame featured a four-cylinder engine based on a cast cylinder block, which was another outstanding feature for that time. Not to mention the specifications of the 2.9 liter engine. It produced 20 horses and could accelerate the car up to 45 miles per hour. In the past, shifting gears was a real mess. Ford developed a special gearbox for the Model T with simple and easy to understand pedal controls. There was no need for a clutch at all because the pedal had three positions, neutral, downshift, and upshift. There was also a brake pedal. Instead of a gas pedal, there was a lever behind the steering wheel. In modern cars, there is a lever to control the windshield wipers. That was enough to teach any kind of farmer how to drive a Ford in a couple of hours. Similar cars in the U.S. market were worth at least $2,000, so only a banker's son could afford such expenses. It was simply impossible to buy such a car for $800 and later for $500. That's why the Tin Lizzie attracted queues of farmers, clerks, salesmen, and people who just cared about their freedom of movement. We are not surprised by the enormous sales of the Model T. Only in 1909, more than 12,000 cars were sold. The next year, 19,000, and by 1912, the total annual production of Ford cars was 70,000 items. Tin Lizzie was about 90% of the world's car fleet, and that was the car that put the world on wheels. The price of the base version had dropped to $290 by the time the last Model T rolled off the assembly line on May 27, 1927, and 15 million cars had been sold. Only the Volkswagen Beetle was able to surpass that record in the greatly expanded market after World War II. How Henry Ford Invented the Assembly Line Wait. How is this possible? How many people do you need to attract in order to assemble each year half a million cars in craftsman conditions, then sell them at a minimal price and make a good profit? That's what Henry Ford is all about. He developed the idea of the flow production process, implementing it in its most efficient manner by 1913. Simply put, he almost invented the assembly line and managed to make the assembly process several times cheaper and faster. In the 260 meters squared factory, there were light and perfectly ventilated halls in which belt conveyors were installed. The frame was installed at the beginning of the conveyor belt, and at the end of the belt, a finished car was pulled out. Each worker performed a specific operation. It was not a big deal. Once the part was delivered, the worker installed it, and the conveyor belt supplied the next vehicle. No extra fuss, no squatting, and no hustling around the workshop. 
Production and assembly steps were organized sequentially so that parts were transported to the assembly point by the shortest route without any hassle. This reduced the chassis assembly time from 12 and a half hours in October to 2 hours and 40 minutes by December 30th, 1913. Every part in the shop moves, boasted Ford in 1922. By purchasing parts in large quantities, Henry was able to reduce their price. Moreover, thanks to such highly optimized production, the cost of the finished product was not much different from the cost of the parts. A 15-minute lunch break, including time to go to the bathroom, was the only break in the boring routine of monotonous work. But the workers were paid five bucks a day, working only eight hours, which were the best conditions in the United States. The era of automobiles in the U.S. begins. Rigid cost control and time-saving production of the Model T sometimes reached absurdity. It is known that for a certain period, Tin Lizzie was sold only in black, simply because black dye was the cheapest option and lacquer with black pigment dried much faster. Henry Ford's statement that any customer can have a car painted any color that he wants as long as it is black is related to this. This phrase indeed was relevant, but only between 1909 and 1914, when the Tin Lizzie's circulation was enormous. By 1927, Ford had become the sole proprietor of the entire production cycle, starting with ore mining and ending with the production of electrical components. By this time, the Tin Lizzie had become obsolete and was replaced on the assembly lines of Ford's plants by the Model A. The Ford A failed to beat the record of the Tin Lizzie, but it was also sold quite well, both in the States and in Europe. The price of the base model at the time was $390, the car was sold in more than 20 configurations, and more than 5 million copies were sold between 1927 and 1931. Also, the Ford A is famous for the fact that it was the first mass-produced all-metal V8 engine block, thereby marking the era of the V8 among American automakers. The Model A was still at the forefront of the global automotive industry in many aspects, but Henry's days ticked away. His son Etzel became the company's manager, the model range expanded, the world market faced global changes due to wars, but we will remember Ford cars as the world's first affordable, reliable, and unpretentious vehicle that gave millions of simple people the freedom to travel. <laughs>